The church has, since the very beginning, struggled to define correctly the difference between a true, genuine, legitimate believer or a true, legitimate, genuine, legitimate church and one that is false, fake, or illegitimate. In the book of Acts, Paul and Peter, for a moment at least, found themselves on opposite sides of the debate between those who believed in the uh, mandates of Judaism, such as circumcision, the Sabbath, and the kosher laws, that they should be applied to the new Gentile Christians and those who preached that Christ had superseded all such barriers. The Apostle Paul was right in that discussion. The gospel is faith alone, not faith plus something else, even if that plus is something that Paul himself highly valued. He himself very much appreciated those things about Judaism, but knew that it was not right to add them onto the Gentiles. Fast forward a couple of centuries and you get St. Augustine. St. Augustine rebuked the Donatists, a group that rejected would-be Christians who had recanted their faith, who had given up their copies of the scriptures rather than be thrown into a Roman prison to be tortured or executed. Afterwards, when they wanted to come back to the church, the Donatists said, no, no, you left, you're out. <clears throat> The Donatists saw their fear as a mortal sin. They believed the church belonged to only those who can demonstrate that they are saints here on earth. St. Augustine disagreed, and rightly so, and he proclaimed instead that the church is, all, is for all those who are seeking by faith to be saints one day by the Spirit's power. Regardless of how far along that process they have come. Thus, our church and every church is a mixture of both saints and sinners, of people who have been transformed by the Spirit and those who are just starting the process, those who are making some progress in that direction, but not those who have already made it there. But for our purposes, St. Augustine also is a negative example in this because he then went too far. He urged the Emperor Constantine to use the Roman army. Now, a few decades later, the Roman army was on the church's side because of Constantine's conversion. And so Augustine said, use force to make the Donatists admit that we're right, to make them fellowship with us again and threaten them with it. That was, of course, a mistake. You could jump ahead uh, a little more than a thousand years uh, to the pilgrims. When they came to the United States, well, to America, certainly wasn't the United States yet, that's a long way in the future. They came here largely to worship God according to their conscience, and we think, well, absolutely, we're all for that. Most people don't know, however, that they turned around and imprisoned, and in some cases tortured, Quakers who came to their colony seeking the same thing. That freedom is for us, not for you. Which brings us to the man in the picture, Pastor John MacArthur. Many of you know the name if you don't know the face. He has served the church, his church there, Grace Community in California, longer than I've been alive. Uh, and he has passion and zeal that I have absolutely no cause to doubt. He has done great things for the kingdom of God. But during 2020, He's walked down this road of error, the same one that Peter and the pilgrims and St. Augustine when he tried to enforce his view. Now that's good company to say, I'm doing the same thing that St. Augustine and the apostle Peter and the pilgrims did. But in this case, it also illustrates how difficult the church has found this topic to be, how often we have erred, how hard it is for us to sort this out. Because those examples were all wrong in this case. So what disclaimer to being a true, genuine, legitimate disciple of Jesus Christ did John MacArthur choose to add in 2020? He actually did it twice on two different related topics. The first topic was about politics. He said that if you don't vote his way, you're on the outside looking in. Here's the quote, and I watched the whole interview to make sure the context was correct. He said, any real, true believer is going to be on your side in this election. He said that to a politician. 
any real true believer is going to be on your side. So in other words, it has to be, a, and he went on to explain that it's a straight party ticket that you have to vote. And for the foreseeable future, that is the only way that any true legitimate Christian could vote. In his mind, there's no room to vote for that other major party, no room to vote for a third party, no room to decide that your conscience dictates that you shouldn't vote at all in any particular election. Big one, small one, doesn't matter. In his mind, you're either with us or you're outside the kingdom of God. On that basis alone, I find that very troubling. And secondly, a little bit later, he made similar comments about the topics of health and science. That if you don't agree that defying local authorities and reopening your church during the pandemic with no restrictions, none at all, if you don't agree that that is correct, you too are probably out in the cold. He said, there's so many false forms of the church, let them shut down. The context of that quote was a criticism of Andy Stanley's church in Georgia. Because Andy Stanley's church, he and his elders had decided that for the rest of 2020, they were going to remain remote in a very urban setting, very high case counts. They said, we'll just go through the end of December. And this was response to that. Whatever your opinion on politics or health and science, whether you agree with John, uh, with Pastor MacArthur on either one of those topics or not, does John MacArthur or anyone else, whoever they may be, whatever position they might hold, does such a person have the right to declare that those who disagree with them in either direction are false Christians? Have we been given such power or authority by God? Has any of us been given such authority? As a consequence, is the true church just a tiny majority of those who say they follow Christ, with literally billions of self-professed Christians in our world today self-deluded because they are not saved? Is that the church that we have well, long story short, the answer is absolutely not. That's not the church. It's clearly not. Today's text from the Gospel of Mark is one of the reasons why that is not the view of the church that we need to have. Let's take a look at Mark 9, 38 to 41. I know that was a long introduction, uh, but I wanted to give you some context to this topic in church history. Teacher, said John. We saw someone driving out demons in your name. Now remember where this comes in the Gospel of Mark, our recent messages. We are after the failure of the disciples to drive out a demon, so that makes this a very poignant topic. We're after Jesus predicting his death for a second time, and we're after Jesus' rebuke of his disciples, which just happened when they were arguing about which one of them is the greatest. That's where we stand. Interestingly, this is the only time in the Gospel of Mark that John is singled out for something. But in this case, he's actually speaking for the other 11. We saw someone. For whatever reason, John speaks instead of Peter in this case. Now, John doesn't say exactly when this took place. When did you see this happen? But now is the time that he feels the need to bring it up to Jesus, to bring it to Jesus' attention and say, what should we have done? Was that the right thing? When we saw someone driving demons in your name, we'll see what they did in a minute. The someone in question is not a person who is part of the official entourage of Jesus. He doesn't travel with Jesus. The disciples didn't know this guy. They saw him driving out demons in the name of Jesus, and they didn't know who he was. He was an unknown. So in that sense, he was not a disciple of Jesus in the narrow sense not someone who walked with Jesus, who knew Jesus personally, and like the 12, was following him literally around. But this man was able to drive out demons, plural. He had success at it more than once, and of course, the legitimate disciples failed to do that just recently, but he was able to do this in Jesus' name. That he did so as one who claims to be a follower of Jesus, a devotee of Jesus. He said, in the name of Jesus Christ, and he commanded the demon to come out of someone. How did the disciples respond to this scenario? We told him to stop, 
because he was not one of us. The disciples shut down this unlicensed vendor. They told him to take a hike because he didn't have the right paperwork. John doesn't tell us what happened next. Did the men argue with them? Did he leave? Was he upset? We don't know what happened to this man. We don't know anything else about him. Well, John's decision and the rest of the disciples choosing to try to shut this man down raises two areas that we need to consider. And one is the definition of what is one of us. How do we know if someone is one of us or not? They thought they knew the answer. Jesus is going to give a different answer in a minute. And the second related question is about control and organization. Who's in charge in the church? Who says what goes and what doesn't go? What is right and what isn't? The disciples' actions and their subsequent discussion with Jesus will address an important topic that comes, has come up again and again in church history. And that was our introduction. Does God work only through official channels? Like the spiritual version of a copyright, do you need to be officially sanctioned and licensed and whatever by God in order to be a part? Or does God also work outside the box? Google outside the box. Everybody loves the phrase outside the box. They love to claim that their business process, their church process, everybody loves being outside the box, at least uh, officially. But does God that work that way? Does God work with individuals or unaffiliated groups? Does God even work with those that seem radical to most of the church? Does God work with those that seem dangerous to the church, at least to the church hierarchy? Well, the answer is yes. Yes, God works beyond the structure of the church. In the scriptures, we see this many times. We see God working beyond Israel, official Israel in the Abrahamic covenant with Melchizedek. When Abraham comes along to the land of Canaan, the land of promise, Melchizedek is already there as a priest of God most high. And you wonder, where'd this guy come from? Abraham didn't bring him along. Abraham acts as if he's higher in the hierarchy than him. It's a very interesting situation. Of course, also in the scriptures, uh, we see Moses' father-in-law, Jethro. He knew the Lord. How did he know the Lord? We see Rahab and Ruth. We see Naaman uh, being cured of his leprosy, the foreigner. We see the three wise men. None of them were children of Abraham. And yet God spoke to and worked through them. And of, so and of course, we see Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. The Ethiopian eunuch is trying to find his way to God based on the scriptures. He needs help from Philip, but Philip didn't go to him. It went the other way around. Well, I mean, the spirit sent him to, to him, but the man was already searching. And then when you get into church history, you see similar patterns develop. An early church man named Antony was famous as being a hermit. That was different. He decided to go out and live in the wilderness. What about him? They thought he was a saint in the early church. We look, at, shake our heads and say, it's a little bit odd. There's another one that's even more odd, though. A man named Simeon the Stylite. And you don't know what a stylite is, but that's okay, because neither did I till I learned about Simeon a few years ago. He went up on a pillar, and they had a little, little house, like a tree fort, and he stayed there the rest of his life. It was at the crossroads of two important roads, and he sat up there, and people came to him from all over Syria because they thought he must know something. And he preached from up there, and large crowds were down below, but he never left his tower the rest of his life. They took food up on a basket, on a rope kind of thing, and you're thinking, that's odd. The church didn't know what to do with a guy like that. Certainly it seemed like God was doing something through him, through it because of all the people that came to the Lord through his ministry. What about John Wycliffe? The church in England didn't have a clue what to do about John Wycliffe wanting to trans, uh, translate the Bible into English, an unauthorized translation. What about Joan of Arc? Church in France had no idea what to do with her. What about Jan Hus? The church in Bohemia uh, had no idea what to do with him. They ended up burning him at the stake. 
same as they killed Joan of Arc. Uh, what about the radical mission work of Francis Xavier, the Catholic missionary, or Hudson Taylor, the Protestant missionary, both of whom went into China and said, you know what, we're going to do things differently. We're going to dress like the Chinese. We're going to show their culture respect. We're going to do something interesting. And they had success in their ministries when the official church, the normal process, was to act with disdain toward that culture. Those are just a few of the, those are just the ones that pop into my mind after a few minutes of thinking about these things. Whether it's the old covenant or the new, God continuously seems to be working outside the box with people that are different and situations that we don't expect. So Jesus' response to his disciples, shutting down the man who was preach, or excuse me, casting out demons in his name, is this. Do not stop him, Jesus said, for no one who does a miracle in my name can in the next moment say anything bad about me. We've got to unpack that and figure out what he's saying. Jesus puts an end here to the disciples' desire to have a monopoly on miracles or their need to control the work of God, to have it all be official. You see, the power of God is not like any of the powers that we imagine in fiction. It is not like Merlin's magic. It is not like Sauron's ring. It is not like Yoda's force. It's not like any of them. It cannot be misused. It cannot be twisted to evil. And it most certainly cannot be accessed by anyone working against the will of God. I'll explain why in a minute, but let that sink in for a second. The power of God can never be used for evil. It can never be accessed by someone who's trying to thwart God. For a very good reason. God is personal. His power is his power. It's not some power out there in the universe that you can learn to grab onto. It's God's power. It's not available with magic words or mystical rituals or pretending to make circles with a ring like Dr. Strange. That's not how you get the power of God. The only way to have access to the power of God is to have a relationship with God himself, to be known by God and to know God. So it's impossible for that power to be misused. Not that God's name isn't misused. We certainly know that the name of God is misused all the time. People doing things shameful in the name of the church or in the name of Christianity. Obviously, that has happened and continues to happen to this day. But all such people that are doing such things, immoral things or shameful things in the name of Christ, are hypocrites. Charlatans would be cult leaders because they are operating outside the power of God. They are, in the truest sense of, sense of the word, fakes and charlatans because they can't possibly have the power of God if they're working against the will of God. It's an impossibility. That's not the way this works. Uh-oh, I accidentally am quoting The Force Awakens. I, it comes to me, that's not the way it works on uh, trying to explain. Sorry, couldn't help myself. Anyone who has a relationship with God sufficient for him or her to access the power of God in order to help someone. In other words, God is working through you to help someone in need. How can such a person be a threat to the gospel proclamation of the church? God knows that person and approves of the work that they're doing sufficiently that, God, that they have access to God's power. So Jesus says, how could he work against me if, he, if I'm working through him? Doesn't make any sense. And then he says this, and this is the heart of our contemplation for this morning. For whoever is not against us is for us. You say, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Jesus also, in Matthew 12, 30 and Luke 23, they're both the same uh, passage, said, whoever's not with me is against me. And I've seen this used as like a cartoon to mock Christians. See, Jesus couldn't even tell whose side he was on. Of course, neither uh, case are they reading the context, because the context is very different. And this is not a contradiction at all. 
In Matthew and Luke, Jesus is talking about the Pharisees who are opposed to the work of God, who are working against God because they are claiming that Jesus is using Satan's power to drive out demons. The whoever, when he says whoever is not against, or excuse me, whoever is not with me is against me, the whoever there are the people opposed to God's will, God's mission. But here in Mark 9:40, the whoever is everyone who is working with God, for the will of God, on God's side. It's really just the difference between interfaith and intrafaith. Interfaith means the difference between Christians, Hindus, Muslims, Buddhists, that kind of thing. So in Matthew 12.30 and Luke 11.23, Jesus is saying no to universalism, that not every path is valid, not every uh, method works for God. But here in Mark 9.40, he is making an intra-faith, which is an ecumenical statement. He is basically saying, I have many sheep, as we saw in our opening scripture. I have many sheep. Some of them aren't in the flock that you know but I am still working there. Not everything that God is doing are you aware of. That's the difference between these two statements. So let's look at for whoever is not against us is for us. Given that we're talking about fellow men and women who are working with us for the betterment of the kingdom of God, which is of course God's kingdom, it stands to reason that we are on the same team with all such people whether we know them, like them, approve of them, or not. If we are all working together for the kingdom of God, then we're on the same team. The power that makes that work possible comes from God, as does the mission that we're supposed to be on together. And so too, uh, one day will God judge all of us, each and every one of us, for how well we did our role in his mission. We need to let this thought sink in real good and make sure that we have a firm grip on it. It's not our church. It's not our gospel. And it most definitely is not our heavenly kingdom. We don't get to decide who's on the guest list. We don't even look, get to look over God's shoulders and say, I wouldn't invite him. God and God alone makes those decisions. And his word has made it abundantly clear that the entire operation of the gospel is on the basis of grace. That God will have mercy on whom God will have mercy. So we can stop being volunteer gatekeepers. Because there will be many whom we have not chosen upon whom God's spirit is at work. They may not do things our way. They may not fit in our social circles. They may not fit with our politics. But if God has begun his work in them, bringing forth the fruit of the Spirit and evidencing a proclamation of the Lordship of Jesus Christ, then you and I and everyone in the church has zero right to stand in their way. Now, to be sure, this is not a call to abandon all discernment, to ignore heresy and turn a blind eye to immorality. Those are standards which God has set and told us to be aware of, to be on our guard against false gospels, to watch out for those who would bring the gospel into disrepute because of their immorality. Those are commands from God, and in this case, it is as well. This is a command from God telling us to set aside all of our petty and ridiculous ways of excluding people from fellowship. These are people for whom the blood of Jesus Christ has been shed. Anyone for God is with us. And if we choose to exclude them because of our reasons, we do so in defiance of God. Not a good choice. Lastly, 
Jesus pushes the envelope a little further. Truly, I tell you, anyone who gives you a cup of water in my name because you belong to the Messiah will certainly not lose their reward. Here's a final emphasis on Jesus' point. Jesus broadens the definition of who is considered to be a fellow worker for the Lord by making even the smallest kindness, even the smallest kindness done as an act of faith, done in his name, something that declares that someone is on our team. How do we know that that's how far he's trying to go? Well, he has said just right here, that he will not only remember their actions, but reward them. So how could you or I oppose someone that God is willing to reward? Only our own faults of pride and prejudice and ignorance would explain that level of folly. So instead, let us give thanks when we receive that cup of water remembering that not everyone who serves the Lord as a disciple of Jesus Christ need do so wearing our team colors. After all, it is we who are called to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ, not to make others in our own image. Let me give you three words of application about this text. Number one, We need to define one of us by God's standard. The church has struggled with this generation after generation, wanting to tweak it a little, add something, subtract something, to make it more palatable, more favorable, to eliminate our enemies, that kind of thing. That's not the way it works. Secondly, to have access to the power of God is to have relationship with God. Those evidencing the fruit of the Spirit are obviously in relationship with God. Otherwise, they wouldn't have that. Because you can't get it any other way. And then thirdly, then, everyone working for the betterment of the kingdom of God is on the same team.